Well, it's, it's important not to be uh, to um, to make too big assumptions about what you're going to get. Uh, ultimately, um, there, to my mind, there is no unitary phenomenon to be understood. There are only sets of phenomena to be understood in situ. So, to take uh, a simple example, if one's studying organisations, say, there isn't the organisation as a whole and how one can understand it through naturally occurring data. There is only the organisation as conducted, say, in a job interview, or the organisation as produced in the way in which the uh, a, a firm sets out set out its accounts. So, I, I've used this to. The term I use to describe this in my books is hyphenated phenomena. That what we're trying to study is always phenomena with hyphens related to particular kinds of contexts, where these contexts can't necessarily be put together as a whole. So again, actually, one needs to have scare marks about that just as much as natural, because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it implies an assumption of reality out there where we know that the social world is not quite as stable and as, uh, as obvious as it, as it might appear to us in everyday life. That's a complex issue uh, with, a, with a number of possible causes. I think one of the things that I've argued with um, Paul Atkinson is that we live in what we call an interview society. The, 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 the truth the, the, the real world appears to us to consist largely in accounts that people offer of their experiences. So that, for instance, um, if there's some terrible accident or something, we expect to be informed about what it signifies by interviews with people who've been through that event. And there's a kind of authenticity that it seems to attach to that. So it's something to do with the structures of the media, the world in which we live in, that somehow we, we believe that Truth is, consists in authentic statements of people who've been involved with some kind of uh, phenomena, to, which has gone to, uh, here I become quite moralistic, I mean, it's gone to a ridiculous extent. To, to now it seems to me, judging by the people who are willing to talk about horrible situations they've been through, say when they've lost a loved one, that almost, uh, and this has been sometimes called the Princess Diana phenomenon, that people, that grieving has to be in public, you know, that one's grieving is not authentic unless one's given an interview about it to somebody on television. So I think that's one reason. The second reason I come across about why people don't think about naturally occurring data is they think it's too complicated to study. Uh, that all, it's far simpler and quicker just to gather, say, a dozen interviews with people and then report back what, what, what people say than going out to study the complexities of the, of the everyday world. But in fact, you can demonstrate that actually both data, data gathering and analysis need not be as complex as people assume it to be. And my task with students, PhD students, when I do <coughs> workshops, is to show that things aren't quite so complex. First, just to take the issue of speed, um, it's even quicker than doing 12 interviews simply to analyze some naturally occurring data that is out there on the internet or to work with documents to take a couple of examples. So, you know, the argument about speed just simply doesn't, doesn't arise. And there are systematic methods of analysing naturally occurring data if only people had uh, come across them. No data speaks for themselves. I mean, it always, always depends on having a particular kind of perspective. I suppose where I come from, uh, as a sociology and a sociologist and as a, a constructionist is I'm always looking for how the participants are producing together certain recognizable features such that they could which they can recognize in whatever they're doing they're doing so to take a, a concrete example uh, many years ago I did a study of a doctor working in private practice and compared to his work to what he was doing in the NHS. So sitting there in his private waiting room as the patient, private office, as patients came in, I was observing, for instance, things like territory. I was observing things like, uh, for instance, the way in which in the, pr in the private practice, 
patients would sit down as soon as they came in, whereas in the NHS they would be they would stand up until they were invited to sit down. And then I noticed things like uh, when the doctor put up a slide to or an X-ray to to look at, um, many private patients would get up out of their chairs and stand behind him and look at the slide, even though presumably they had no idea what they were looking at. Uh, whereas in, I never saw this in the NHS. So two simple examples of using your eyes here. I wasn't able to use visual recording methods, but they were treat, they were constituting their interaction as rather different. Presumably, one might speculate that what the private patient was doing was saying, you know, I've paid for this time, this I'm renting this territory. It's my own, I can do with it what I like. And similarly, just to, just to follow that through a bit more on a different aspect, what you discover in, what I discovered in the private consultation was that people were booked in for 30 minutes. And if the topic for which they had been there was over in five minutes, they weren't dismissed. Rather, the, they would use the remaining time to ask questions about other things. They would, although this was a cancer specialist, they would turn it into a general practice consultation, either about themselves or about their relatives. Once again, one saw social organization there at work, that there were assumptions about what the patient could do with his or her time, which simply didn't operate uh, inside the, 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 the NHS. So a large part of it is using one's, one's eyes, but informed by a particular theoretical position.